chapter 25, verse 27. Title of the message is Poison Pride, Toxic Sugar. Poison Pride, Toxic Sugar. Dear Holy Father, we do pray that you'll break strongholds today, God. We do pray, Father, you will move those that are bound by addictions, Lord. Father, we do pray that we'll turn our eyes from ourselves, Father, and give you glory in all things, Father. We do pray, Lord, that the spiritual life will be healed, Father, as well as our physical life, that we might be in health and prosper, even as our soul prospers, God. Thank you for your holy Bible. Thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit. We do pray that you would move upon us today, move upon the preaching, in the name of the Lord Jesus, our Savior, amen. My text is 25, verse 27 of Proverbs. It is not good to eat much honey, so for men to search their own glory is not glory. I hope today to move you to make some crucial New Year's resolutions that can be life-saving. We've been preaching for decades now about certain aspects of health. And finally now, after all this time, it's on the front page of newspapers around the world. Front page newspapers around the world. I believe we ought to be at the forefront of discerning the times. And God says He gives secrets to those who fear Him. None of us fear Him the way we should, and we don't know what we should. We should know a lot more than we know. I should know a lot more than I know. And God has given us the ability. But I praise God for whatever He has revealed, and may we learn to fear Him more and not count the good things of His Word, the wisdom of His Word, a strange thing, see. Before we look closer at this important Bible verse, I want to notice some other related verses. I want you to notice what this verse does not say. It does not say that honey in itself is bad or unhealthy. Okay? It says it's not good to eat much honey. There's a big difference here. When honey is raw and pure, it's very healthy. Very, very healthy. The key in God's word is moderation concerning good things and abstinence in regard to unhealthy things. See, many modern Christians, they want to be moderate in regard to unhealthy things. No, no, wait, wait a second. No, no, the Bible says look not at the wine. And you ought to see how we've been preaching that for years because it's in the Bible. It says look not at the wine, talking about alcohol. And I'm going to tell you something. That's another thing that's on the forefront of science now. They're finding out that, uh uh-oh, just a little bit of alcohol is bad. God is always right, amen? And as long as we, by faith, humbly look and believe what He says, God will bless us, and you will be way ahead of most people. Now, the important word I want you to see here is much. Much, which we're going to come back to. It is not good to eat much honey. So there are good things, but if the good thing isn't balanced in its right place, it's not good anymore. That's a whole new concept for us, isn't it, sometimes? I want to first establish that pure, raw, natural honey is good for you. Uh, Proverbs, I'm not talking about honey that somebody's added a bunch of corn syrup to or, or, or that type of thing. I'm talking about pure, raw honey, you know. Notice uh, Proverbs 24, verse 13. My son, eat thou honey because it is good. And the honeycomb, which is sweet to thy taste, so shall the knowledge of wisdom be unto thy soul. When thou hast found it, then there shall be a reward. Ah, I get it now. There is a command to eat honey, and this will bless your natural life. This is a command to eat honey. It will bless your natural life, and that will become a picture. The blessings you get from it will be a picture of what God's wisdom will do for your spirit, for your soul, for your life in the world to come and in eternity. So honey becomes a picture of God's knowledge. In the Bible, honey sometimes pictures God's wisdom and therefore God's word. Look at Psalms 119, 103. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. The word of God is sweeter than honey, but the Bible says, what is sweeter than honey? Now, wait a second. On modern sweet scales, 
They say that sugar, sucrose is sweeter than honey. Not maple sugar, not palm sugar, not sorghum. But they say this thing called sucrose is sweeter than honey. You know, I think we've got a counterfeit of the Word of God now. God says the thing that is sweeter to hot, sweeter than honey is His Word. And I don't believe there's anything sweeter than honey that's good for you. I believe a lot of people, instead of getting comfort from the Bible, they get comfort from junk food. Instead of going through problems and then opening the scriptures and letting the Holy Ghost speak to their soul, I think we got a counterfeit Bible and they put it in their mouth and they eat it. And I believe that junk food has become the, 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 the comfort to many today. In Proverbs 25, verse 27, honey is a picture of glory. It is not good to eat much honey, so for men to search their own glory is not glory. Ezekiel 20 also seems to imply that honey is a picture of glory. Glory. We learn it's not good to eat much honey. And this goes back to what the Holy Ghost has already taught in Proverbs 25 in the wisdom of Solomon. Look at Proverbs 25 verse 16. Has thou found honey? This is obviously talking about a wild, raw honey, not some Walmart thing and a little honey bear-looking thing that's all corrupted. This is talking about a wild, raw honey that you can find. Has thou found honey, eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith and vomit it. And then... Connected to this is withdraw thy foot from thy neighbor's house, lest he be weary of thee, and so hate thee. What you're learning here is a principle that good things can be abused. The hospitality of your neighbor can be abused. Hospitality is good, and what a blessing it can be, but you can take it for granted and go too far with it. In the same way, honey is good. As the Bible has said. But the Bible says, eat so much as is sufficient unless you be filled therewith and vomit it. Okay. I preached a sermon not too long ago on the importance of eating fruit and how fruit will make you happy. And we apply that to our spiritual life. When you get spiritual fruit in your life, it brings joy to your life, a good conscience. But we all know, just as with too much honey, eating too much sweet fruit can make you feel sick. What's interesting is after so many years of being in the dark, modern nutritionists and many modern researchers are finally starting to agree with the Bible. And they are discovering something very interesting. Look at the words of Matthew Henry, a Bible commentator who died in 1714. The words of Matthew Henry now read like many scientific headlines and newspaper headlines around the world today. Listen to what Matthew Henry said. Honey, if eaten with moderation, is very wholesome. Yet if eaten to excess, it becomes nauseous and is the occasion of many diseases. Almost the exact words are in headlines across the country today. Clearly, there is a physical danger in eating too much honey. And it now appears that Matthew Henry Henry and others were right in understanding that this includes more than just a one-time stomach ache. We all know that if you eat too much fruit, you can get a one-time stomach ache. But maybe that is a picture of something far more dangerous in your life. And that is that that one-time stomach ache, that one-time sickness, is a picture of something else that is happening to your entire system. That when you overload your system with sweets that have, that have a purpose, when you overload your system, it can lead to many diseases and sicknesses. This is a command. This is a command. You can't just say, oh, well, I just trust God. Well, trust God and read the Bible. God says that if you eat too much honey, you're going to get sick.
What applies to honey, I believe in principle, can apply to other sweets, to fruits, and to what nutritionists today call carbohydrates in general, or we might call them carbs in general. So let's apply this principle. How many Christians are sick because they eat too many carbs? I wonder. I wonder. And right here in the Bible, all along, it was trying to show you. It was trying to tell us. I believe there are some important guidelines that are often forgotten today when dealing with carbs. By carbs, I mean fruit, honey. Uh, I'm talking about uh, grain. I'm talking about this whole realm of what modern nutritionists call carbohydrates. And I believe if you follow these guidelines, it will bless you more than you ever can imagine. Here's the first principle that we need to learn about these things called carbs, whether you're dealing with honey or grain or whatever it is. Number one principle, they were not empty or overly refined and chemically laden. If they're bad for you when they're in the perfect state, if you overdo them, what happens when you take away the vital properties out of these things? What happens when your honey becomes high fructose corn syrup? What happens when your grains are filled with pesticides and they're just white flour that's been bleached? What happens when you take away the vital properties out of it? You're left with chemicals. You're left with drugs, really. And if it's bad in its natural state, what in the world is happening to people? What type of overload are they getting when there's no food left in the very carb itself? Wow. Number two. In the Bible, they usually ate their carbs with a protein. Honey and fish. Bread and fish. And they often ate their carbs with vinegar. Dip their bread in the vinegar. That type of thing. Now we know that the protein keeps the carb from raising your blood sugar. So when the carb is not empty and refined, I mean, you eat it empty and refined with no vital food left in the carb, it's going to shoot your blood sugar up and cause other problems. But when the grain is a whole grain and the honey is whole and everything is in its natural state that God made it to be eaten and then you add a protein with it and then you add vinegar after your meal or with water or something they find out that the blood sugar does not spike it can handle the carb wow how many people are Doing these things. No, no, modern American, modern American Christians are eating refined grains. They're eating things that aren't even honey. And then they're not eating them with protein. They're not keeping their blood sugar regulated. Number three, carbs were often eaten in Bible days when there has been much activity. Jonathan, after fasting and fighting battles, ate some honey. And the Bible says his eyes were enlightened. He's still in what we call afterburn. Likewise, when the disciples had been walking through the fields and were weary, they ate some grain. When God had Ezekiel lie on his side with no activity for many days, he gave him only five to ten ounces of bread a day. And even then, he mixed some beans, some protein with the bread. Maybe this reveals to us more than just a picture of the coming siege. Maybe this is showing us another key that when activity is less, you need less carbs. But what's happening to Americans? They're getting no exercise. They're sitting around in front of computers, and they're eating carbs. They're eating carbs. They're eating carbs. What's happening to your body? You're getting sick. You're getting sick. Now, for some time, many top health researchers have been on an anti-grain campaign. We've said all along, y'all have it wrong. You have it part right, but but you're wrong. In the Bible, they ate barley, they ate wheat, they ate millet. But now, just last night, ironically, after I'd already finished my sermon, Mercola sends out an email saying, groundbreaking new information. Researchers are coming out with books with titles such as Eat Wheat, a scientific and clinically proven approach to safely bring wheat and dairy back into your diet. What are they saying now? They're saying, uh, we've been wrong. 
As long as it's pesticide free, it's the pesticides that are destroying your digestion. Get organic wheat, non-GMO. And as long as you don't refine it, as long as it's whole grain, and as long as it's sourdough, and it has the properties to properly digest it, you can begin to bring it back into your diet. But even they say, but wait a second, only after you've regained your fat-burning ability. What are they saying? They are saying that carbs, they need to be whole, pesticide-free, but they're saying that you can get to a place where you're overloaded, you're overcharged, and your body will no longer burn fat. And what happens is, these carbs will be stored as fat. I do believe that we can have a perfect diet even. And who has a perfect diet? Who obeys God in everything? I believe there's some, based upon the wisdom that we know. But you can have a perfect diet and not have proper balance. And you can still have many problems. Especially in our past. If, if your past has been filled with junk food addiction, alcohol, vaccines. I mean, what can be worse than a vaccine, you know? Uh, if you've had all of this in your past, you're still healing in many ways, see? And you can get out of balance even with a perfect diet. Notice Psalms 35, I humbled my soul with fasting, said David. Oh, Wow. You can retrain your body to burn fat and get out of this carb overload state that you put yourself in. And just as our spiritual life sometimes needs to be reset, often needs to be reset. Hey, Job was perfect, but the Bible says that he got reset spiritually. He said, I'd only heard of God before in some ways, but now my eye sees you and I abhor myself and repent. Job got reset. Peter said, depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. He got reset, even after being saved. Isaiah saw the Lord high up, lifted up on his throat, and he said, I'm a man of unclean lips. He got reset spiritually, folk. I'll tell you what, we can come to a place of humility where we realize that we were walking in pride, even as believers, amen? And we need to be spiritually reset. We need to be humbled. And the Bible says you humble yourself. God won't have to humble you. It's the same with your physical body. Your body needs to be reset in some way. And when you fast, it's a way of resetting your body. Resetting your body. You can get overcharged with carbs and sweets to where they will no, no longer even be burned in your body, but will be stored. And I believe many people are getting sick and diseased from overly refined carbs and sweets. And then they're not active enough. Even when they're eating healthy carbs, they're not active enough to burn them. You can eat palm sugar and honey and whole wheat, sourdough, organic, and even balance it. But you're not active enough to justify those carbs. You're not balancing these things with proteins. You're not having vinegar with meals and things to help you digest these carbs. And ultimately, you're ignoring the biblical warning in regard to mod moderation. God says honey's good, but you better be moderate with it or you're going to get sick. Man, if you've got to be moderate with honey, what is this telling you? It's telling you with all carbs, you need moderation, especially all foods you need moderation with. But the Bible's saying especially carbs, you need moderation. Wow. Now, if you think this is just Old Testament, when we get to the New Testament, one of the main things that Paul says is you let that bishop only have a little bit of wine. That's not talking about alcohol, my friend. That's talking about grape juice. You say, what, moderation in grape juice? Oh, yes, that's a car. The Bible's trying to make you healthy. The Bible's trying to tell you something very serious here. It says, you tell those aged women, exhort those aged women, you better cut down on the grape juice. And I believe what it's saying is, what, 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 what's happening around churches all across America? All across America, they are getting together in their women's meetings, and they've got donuts, they've got pastries, they've got soda pop, they don't even have good carbs. They've got bad carbs, and they're overloaded. And these things are good if they're healthy. If they're good, healthy carbs with good, healthy sugars and whole grain, they're good for you. But in moderation, you understand, we get overloaded on these carbs, and it's going to affect your whole life. It's going to affect you emotionally. It's going to affect you physically. And I'll prove that 
shortly here. In fact, let me prove it right now. Not only are they overloaded on these things, they're over-refined, and they're creating death and disease, and they're not burning these things, and they're using them in wrong food combinations, and they're on the road to destruction. Then there are certain carbs and sugars that are toxic in themselves, even in small amounts. They lead to diabetes, inflammation, and disease. God never said put that stuff in your body. Let us hear a warning of our Lord about these last days in case you think I'm missing the boat here. Our Lord Jesus, after telling you that a lot of bad things are coming in the tribulation period in the last days, and he tells you all of these things, you would think, if you listen to modern Christianity, that he would end this whole thing in a different way. But not our Lord. Our Lord, after he ends all of this stuff about the last days and tells you about Sodom, how they were eating and drinking and didn't even know the Lord was, uh, the judgment was coming, listen to how our Lord ends this thing. He said in Luke 21, 34, take heed to yourselves. Okay, we got that. Lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting? Wait, whoa, 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 stop for a second. Where is this in modern Christianity? Our Lord, in regard to the last days, ends his whole sermon with a conclusion. So we're going to sum this whole thing up. You beware in the last days of having your hearts overcharged with surfeiting. And cares of this life, so that the day come upon you unaware. What's it mean to surfeit? To feed with meat or drink, so as to oppress the stomach and derange the functions of the system. To overfeed and produce sickness. Our Lord Jesus says, in the last days, don't overcharge your digestive system. And our Bible says, beware of too much grape juice, beware of too much honey, beware of too many carbs, you will overcharge your digestive system. What does that do? It produces sickness, it produces emotional roller coaster, it, re it produces chaos. But you know what? Jesus says it will even overcharge your heart. Not your physical heart, we know that, but your, but your spiritual heart. Wait a second. You mean I can have even my spiritual heart affected to some degree by surfeiting? Boy, that's scary stuff, folks. I think many Christians around the country are out of balance. I think they're overcharged. I think their physical hearts have been overcharged and their spiritual hearts. It's produced a state of sloth, a state where there's no diligence, where there's addiction, Emotional, up and down. Wow. It's easy to think you have to gorge yourself in gluttony to surfeit. But not our Bible. Our Bible says you eat too much honey, you'll get sick. Man, he's not eating five lamb chops and three steaks. And, I mean, he's eating too much honey. He gets sick. Too many carbs overcharge your system, raise your blood sugar, and they're finding out when your blood sugar raises in a way that it should not, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to have organ damage. You're going to have inflammation. You're going to have diseases like you would not believe come upon you. Let's examine our text again. It is not good to eat much honey. So for men to search their own glory is not glory. In our text, honey is glory. What's too much honey? Searching your own glory. Oh, now I'm getting it. Honey is good. But if I eat too much good honey, that's an example. When I get sick... When these Christians get diabetes, when these Christians are overweight, when these Christians are having all these health problems, uh, having their teeth rot out of their mouth, I mean, when they're having all of these problems, that is a picture of somebody seeking their own glory. Oh, I get it now. What's happening in the physical world leads to destruction of the body. When we walk in pride, that's going to send us to hell. That's going to send us to destruction, judgment seat of Christ, terror of the Lord. The Bible says that haughty spirit leads to destruction. Hey, the haughty spirit leads to destruction, but don't forget the picture, my friend. Too much honey will kill you. 
John chapter 5, How can you believe which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Proverbs 18, A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. He seeks his own glory. Proverbs 72, Let another man praise thee, and not thy own mouth, a stranger, and not thy own lips. In other words, we should not be seeking praise. When somebody gives it to you, thank God for it. And give praise to God for it. But don't go seek it yourself. Don't be a self-praiser. If it's not glory, the Bible says seeking your own glory is not glory, then it must be vain glory. Vain glory. Ah, Philippians 2, let nothing be done through strife or what? Vain glory, which is not glory. That is seeking your own glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. In Galatians 5, the Bible says, He that searches his own glory is like he that eats too much honey. The Bible says, Let us not be desirous of vain glory, seeking vain glory, searching for vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. We'll crank it up a little bit for the rain here. There is a type of self estimation that is wrong when it becomes unreasonable. Listen, l listen to me. I, I could quote many of the old devotional writers. I'll just quote the Bible. If you have a skill, it is not humility to pretend you don't have it. Okay? It is humility to be reasonable about how good you are at what you think you are good at. It is humility to let others praise you and not praise yourself. But the idea that it's somehow humble to just have all this attention, I'm so ugly, I can't do anything right, I'm so this, I'm so... You know, a lot of people would say, you just need to get your eyes off yourself. You're, you're, too, you, you're too caught up in yourself, see. Humility is having a reasonable, sober estimation of your abilities and not being high-minded and inflated Let me show you. Thinking of yourself more highly than you ought to in regard to your gifts and talents and abilities is not right. Proverbs 12 says, I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. Galatians says, let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. And the woman in Proverbs, it says, she perceiveth that her merchandise is good. I mean, come on, she's worked hard to get this merchandise. She knows it is good. Now, she doesn't have an inflated sense of how good it is. She's not sitting here comparing herself to others and saying, mine is so much better than yours, and praising herself in the mirror all day. No, she's saying, I've worked hard. God's given me a blessing. God has allowed me to create these good products, and I'm going to go sell them. And uh, she's not going to undervalue that. Imagine a humble, skilled singer. She's thankful for any praise. She does not have an unreasonable view of her talents based on self-praise. And whatever is sober and sufficient brings her rejoicing. And she gives full glory and thanksgiving to God. But a proud person will seek out praise, and they will boast, and they will have an unreasonable view of himself or herself in whatever area there's pride. And this inflated glory-seeking is pictured in the Bible by sickness and disease that comes from too much honey. A haughty spirit leads to destruction and a fall. So does too much honey lead to vomiting and perhaps even death and disease. Now, there are many wholesome sweets in the world that are good for you that are in that same category as raw honey. The word honey means gold. And in the Bible, I believe every time, or if not most of the time, it refers to that which comes from bees. But there are sugars that we see in the Bible, delium, which is palm sugar. There's maple sugar. There's sorghum, which is a grass that has grown, that has cereal and popcorn on it. It's been a grain they've eaten for thousands of years. And that sorghum syrup, that sorghum molasses is good. Uh, there are fruits and fruit juices. All of these are good if they're pesticide-free. And the Bible says you ought to use proper moderation in regard to all of these good sugars and good sweets and fruit juices. In other words, you ought to say, 
if you sing well. I give glory to God. To whatever degree I sing well, I don't sing well, but to whatever degree you sing well, give glory to God. See, I have a, I have a sober estimation of my singing ability. But uh, if you sing well, thank God for it, amen? Thank God for it. If somebody tells you you sing well, and a lot of people come and tell you you sing well, and you've heard it over and over and over and over, and you know they're not just flattering you, uh, praise God for it. Say, God, thank you that you've given. I'm going to use that to the glory of God. Amen? I'm going to be humble. I'm going to be sober about it. But I'm going to use that to God's glory. Amen? That's a picture of honey used in the right way. Now, when you get inflated, when you say, uh, I uh, am so much better than other people say you are, when you think you can sing well, when you really can't sing well, that's like honey eaten without moderation. Honey eaten without moderation will make you sick. What will boasting do? Well, what will haughty spirit and an inflated idea about your talents and gifts, what will that do? That'll lead to destruction. That'll lead to a fall. Okay, we got it in the physical world. We got it in the spiritual world. But hold on a second. What happens when you don't give God glory and thanks at all for your talents and abilities or works? This becomes what we might call a toxic honey. Any of that, even in the slightest degree, is poison. Is poison. I don't care if you say, well, I have only one little good thing I do, and I'm going to take credit for this and not give glory to God. I'm not going to give thanks to God. I'm going to take pride in myself. It's not that you have a wrong estimation of it. You might be really good at the thing you're proud of, but you're not giving God glory for it. Folks, even a little bit of that is poison. So what we're learning here is there is honey that is good, but there is a toxic honey. There is a toxic sugar that even a little bit is poison. What if people seek their own glory, independent of any awareness or praise that it comes from God? None of this is right, even in little amounts. To possess any glory at all without giving glory to God is wrong. 1 Corinthians 4 says, For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou did not receive? Now if thou did receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou had not received it? That is, not give God glory for it. So in other words, there's two problems here. Two problems. One problem is you're wrong about the fact that you're that you even have an ability. The person thinks they sing very well, and they don't. The person thinks that they're good looking, and they're not very attractive. The person thinks they're strong, and they're not very strong. I mean, there's all kinds of, uh, of things. They, they think they're a good Christian, and they're not a good Christian. You know, So that's wrong. But the other error, wow. Maybe you are right about your talent. Maybe you are right about your ability, but you're not giving God the glory for it. What is that? If one is pictured by honey that's, eaten, uh, that's taken in the body in the wrong amount, the other must be pictured by a honey that is poison, that is toxic in any degree. If the first form of vainglory is likened to too much honey, the second could be likened to toxic honey. Well, let's bring a question here now before us. Does there exist in the world toxic honey? That could be a perfect picture? I'm afraid there does. It's in man's laboratory. When man gets a hold of natural things and turns them into a drug by refining it, it becomes poison. When you look at white sugar, first of all, that is something they got from a sugar cane or a sugar beet and they've gone through this laboratory bleach and this experiment, and they've created a drug. See, that, that, that thing's a perversion. It's a perversion. It's not natural. High fructose corn syrup. That's, that's not just squeezing corn and getting the juice out, my friend. This is a laboratory creation. It's a drug. Nutrisweet and all those alcohol sugars and all that other stuff they're creating in their laboratories. So first of all, that stuff, any degree of it, is toxic. And then there's this thing called cane sugar. 
where they were chewing on a sugar cane. And we've got hundreds of years ago testimony of Arabs chewing on a sugar cane, and they're lethargic. And they have all the signs of what we will call modern diabetes, just from the sugar cane. There's something wrong with it. It's not like honey. We know it's not like honey because scientists put it upon your teeth, and honey heals your teeth, but sugar cane rots them out, even in a little bit. And then they said, wait a second, let me scientifically create the exact thing that's in this jar of honey. So they create the honey in their little laboratory experiment, and then they put it on the teeth, and it still rots it out of their mouth. They said, what in the world is going on? When God creates honey, it doesn't rot the teeth. There are things in nature that are bad. Maybe God made them for clothes. Maybe, God, maybe you should use the flax for clothes. Maybe you should use them to build your house with. But to put it in your body is not right. If too much honey is likened to an inflated idea of our talents and abilities, then toxic honey is likened to self-glory in any degree that forgets God. For 25 years or so, I believe that all cane sugar and high fructose corn syrup and refined sugars are toxic, and I have avoided them. I've made some mistakes over the years in regard to diet, but that's one thing I got right. For a time, I fell for the agave scam, and for one period of time in regard to my children, though I didn't put it in my body, I thought that I was allergic to it, but maybe it would be good for them, I fell for the cane sugar, cane juice scam, I'm sorry, cane juice scam. Where they told you, this is cane juice. We're just squeezing the, 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 the cane. See, that's all we're doing here. This will be good for you. It's right out the sugar cane, you know. And No, that was a big scam. But praise God, for 25 years, I have avoided these things. You say, well, hold on a second. I read history, you know, Little House on the Prairie, and I, I read stuff about sugar in the 1920s, and they would go up to the barber shop or the, or the local drugstore, I'm sorry, and they will get their uh, uh, sugar drink and whatever, their candy. Well, look at the degree they were getting it compared to now. I went to Walmart just to see. The other day, I went to Walmart, uh, yesterday actually, and I uh, walked down just about every aisle of Walmart with a notebook. And I began on aisle number one. And I looked at every food product in aisle number one. I could only find one or two things that didn't have sugar in it. Aisle number two, aisle number three, aisle number four. High fructose corn syrup, dextrose, uh, sugar, 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 sugar. Every product. There was a man who did a documentary not long ago. And he has been off sugar for many, many, many years. And he wanted to see what would happen if he started to eat it. But he said, I'm going to stay away from candy bars, cupcakes, cookies. I'm not going to eat any sweets. I'm just going to go to the store and eat food that you would think is healthy, that normal Americans eat. And then they looked at his blood and they found out he had tons and tons of sugar overload that he was getting in his body just from eating food. Oh, here's some pizza. Here's some steak and cheese pizza. Here's this. Here's that. Here's beans. Here's the peanut butter. I'm just going to eat normal food. And he basically got sick, and the whole documentary shows, I don't recommend it, but it basically shows him getting sick uh, from eating just what you would think is healthy food in Walmart. Uh, when you go back to those early days, researchers have found that at least a third if not three-fourths of the sugar was actually palm sugar and not cane sugar. Secondly, when you read in the South, sorghum was everywhere, and they, they mainly sweetened things with sorghum juice, a very healthy, nutritious sugar. I'm not saying cane sugar was not prevalent. It wasn't prevalent like it is today, and it was not prevalent to the degree. Now, There became a vast cover-up. Since 1957, John Yudkin, who wrote Pure, White, and Deadly, How Sugar is Killing Us, examined the link between sugar and degenerative, degenerative illnesses. 
He showed that sugar and refined sweeteners are closely associated with coronary heart disease and type 2 diabetes. Helping you understand this research. In 2007, among other sermons, I gave you sugar, a deceitful, deadly dainty. And then in 2010, I came out with the shocking sermons, Drunk with Sugar, parts one and two, 2010. Then I followed up in 2013 with Honey or Sugar, and then finally in 2016, Rotten Teeth, Cursing Future Generations. Now, that's not many sermons about this subject that is so important to your health. But I have been a witness in regard. I've tried to live the example of it. I've tried to show you the fruit of it. And I've tried to exhort you. Many people wrote me and said it changed their life. Others ignored it. Many said, look at this crazy preacher. He's actually saying you can get drunk off sugar. He's saying sugar's a drug. 2010. They sounded radical at the time, didn't they? Very few really listened. Wow, seven years ago. Well, how, how might that have changed your life? I didn't just come up and said, thus saith Joey. I showed you. I documented it. How might, that have cha- how might that have saved your children's teeth? Where would you be in your life now, health-wise, had you obeyed it? Well, in 2012... Sugar can make you dumb, U.S. scientists warn. Then all of a sudden, it started pouring out to where year after year after year, my sermon titles do not sound radical anymore. May God be praised. God reveals whatever information and knowledge we have. We don't know what we should know, but may God get the glory. Uh, Here's 2013, National Geographic magazine. The title is Sugar, Why We Can't Resist It. That's National Geographic, 2013. It seems like every time I study an illness, I find my way back to sugar, says Richard Johnson, a nephrologist at University of Colorado, Denver. Why did 153 million people have diabetes in 1980, and now we're up to 347 million? It's toxic. If sugar is so bad for us, why do we crave it? The short answer is that an injection of sugar into the bloodstream stimulates the same pleasure centers of the brain that respond to heroin and cocaine. It is literally an addictive drug. Oh, wow, now preacher's not so crazy. That's front page National Geographic. Not that that's our standard or anything. I'm just saying, hey, if the Bible says don't eat much honey, what do you think it's going to say about cane sugar? So whatever you do, don't call me a nut. When you got National Geographic front page, hey, I'm just up with the times, see. Then 2014, the very next year, eggs don't cause heart attacks, sugar does. Huffington Post. Jesus says an egg is good. It's over. The debate is settled. It's not, it's sugar, not fat, that causes heart attacks. Oops. Fifty years of doctor's advice and government eating guidelines have been wrong. Well, they should have followed the Bible. A rigorously done new study shows that those with the highest sugar intake had a fourfold increase in the risk of heart attack. That's 400%. This follows on the hills of decades of research that has been mostly ignored by the medical establishment and policy makers. All right. 2014, sweet poison, how sugar and not cocaine is one of the most addictive and dangerous substances. Sugar is eight times more addictive than cocaine. New York Daily News. Wow, preacher didn't say, now it doesn't sound so crazy, drunk with sugar. Doesn't sound so crazy now, does it? Then in the past few weeks, it has exploded in mainstream news. Guardian, January 5th, 2017, is sugar the world's most popular drug? The week in the UK, sweet tooth, how sugar became the world's drug of choice. Los Angeles Times, January 13th, how much sugar is too much? Sugar may well be a killer. How often can we smoke cigarettes without doing at least some harm to our health? Doctors these days answer never, thus redefining the concept of moderation. They're applying the same thing with sugar. And some of them are kind of in the dark. They don't know what to do. Uh, uh, With all this new research coming out, and they find out that the sugar companies hid the research, now uh, they're running off a cliff. 
They're saying, I'm not going to eat an apple anymore. I'm not going to eat honey. I'm not going to eat anything. I- I'm done with it. It's killing us. And-, and what I'm saying is, whoa, 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 settle down. Whoa, 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 whoa. An apple is good. Honey is good. But you better keep it in moderation. You better keep it in moderation. But these other things, these chemical sugars, this sucrose, these deadly poisons, this high fructose corn syrup, and even this cane sugar mess, uh, it- it's not edible. I can go eat sorghum. You understand that? I can eat it as a grain. I I can eat the plant. Sugar cane, stay away from it. Stay away from it. Now, uh, here's another one. Uh, New York Times, January 13th. Big sugar secret ally, nutritionist. Another way to say this is that we, what we eat doesn't even matter. It's only how much, just as the sugar industry would have you believe. The assumption ignores decades of medical science. I'm a fierce critic of sugar and believe that it, in fact, may have prematurely killed more people than tobacco. The disorders for which it is deprived suspect, obesity, diabetes, in turn elevate our risk of virtually every major chronic disease, from heart disease to cancer and now Alzheimer's. In the 1970s, when the industry paid Fred Stare, founder of the nutrition department of Harvard School of Public Health, to exonerate sugar... All Mr. Stare had to do was enlist as authors some of the very influential researchers who were convinced that dietary fat was the real enemy. So what they did was they said, fat is the problem. We're not going to eat butter. We're not going to eat uh, coconut oil. And they began to run from fat when actually sugar was the problem all along. Huffington Post, January 13th, hidden added sugar found in two-thirds of Canadian packaged foods as my journey through Walmart showed. What does it mean when the world is addicted to this sugar stuff? It's occurring at the same time that man is addicted to pride. Isn't that that bizarre? Isn't that wild? The more man gets into his self-esteem and self-glory, the more we have this sugar everywhere. As a perfect picture Hey, friends, self-glory is not glory. And there's some things out there that are not sugar. Or put it this way, they're not the honey God wants you to put in your mouth. It says in 2 Timothy 3, For men shall be lovers of their own selves in the last days, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. And it says lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And I'm going to tell you something, my friend. They're addicted. They're rotting the teeth out of their children's mouth. They get their emotional comfort from their junk food. They'll stop going to a church that preaches about it. I tell you what, somebody's addicted to nicotine, you start nailing them cigarettes and start preaching against it. Even if you accept them in a fellowship and you just start preaching against it, I tell you what, they either repent or they begin to run. You understand that? When you go after somebody's drugs, it gets real hot, see. It gets real hot for them. You go after some junk food, you start touching the, 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 the drug that nobody's allowed to discuss, and you start going after, hey, there's a lot of sickness coming from uh, uh, this honey that's not honey, and the abuse of honey, uh, the, these carbs that everybody's addicted to. You start nailing that stuff, I tell you what, you'll ruffle some feathers real quick, won't you, huh? You'll save some life too, amen? Oh, the testimonies will pour in of people's lives being changed, not getting sick anymore. Things starting to change in their household, emotional stability. I mean, all kinds of things start changing, see. Bloomberg, January 4th, Coca-Cola, ABA accused of tobacco-like deception in lawsuit. Federal court complaint alleges Coke downplayed sugar's effects. Sugar drinks are scientifically linked to obesity. Now you can have people running. Because they're going after it just like they did tobacco. They said, hey, you covered it up. You knew there was science, but nevertheless, you began to put it out anyway. And this is what you did with sugar. You purposely paid scientists to cover this up. And you killed a lot of people. People had heart attacks and diabetes. And you're in trouble. We're coming after you. And, you know, this is going to be big news. Science Daily, January the 11th, high sugar diet programs, a short lifespan in flies. The unhealthy diet drives long-term reprogramming of gene and spre- uh, expression. Oh yeah, Proverbs 16 says pride goes before destruction. Pride goes before destruction. 
The West Australian News says people shouldn't be worried about naturally occurring sugars that are found in foods such as fruit and dairy products like milk. Well, yeah, you're right as long as they're pesticide-free. But you should, in one sense, be concerned. Uh, you should make sure that you're getting these in proper moderation, see. So we need to balance everything today. They're, they're getting close. They finally caught up with biblical wisdom, but they're still a little confused about it, see. Here's the Guardian. Child sugar scourge. Thousands having teeth removed in hospital. It is shameful that a problem which is 90% preventable continues to plague our children in this way. I mean, their teeth are rotting out of their mouth so bad they can't even go to a dentist. They have to go to the hospital. Thousands are having to go to the hospital for surgeries from how they've rotted their whole jaw out because of the sugar. BigThink.com says experts call for sugar to be treated as a drug. This is all just in the past few days. Children are developing similar diseases as alcoholics. How humans decide which substances are illegal and dangerous and others acceptable and benign has more to do with politics, marketing, and social mores than science. That's exactly what I preached seven years ago. Just as alcoholics often will not admit their disease, sugar addicts are blind to the ravages it wreaks. Oh, it's okay in moderation. Well, why are your children's teeth rotten out of their mouth? It's okay in moderation. Well, well, why are you having all of these health problems and things that you should not be having? Folks, let's do what we can to be responsible. And if you didn't listen seven years ago or ten years ago or twenty years ago, well, will you listen now that it's on the front page of every side? I mean, now there's, hey, great. At least listen now that everybody understands it. Amen? You could have got in on the thing ten years, fifteen years ago, but now at least get in on it, okay, when it's common knowledge. If you're in the 1960s and the preacher said quit smoking... And you had magazines telling you, oh, doctors recommend camel cigarette. And you're still smoking. You should listen to the preachers. But now that you're all these years later, we realize it was all a big scam. Folks, you ought not smoke. Amen? It's the same with sugar and all these other things. So well, show me that in the Bible. Okay, right there. The Bible says eating too much honey is not good for you. It's right there in the book. It says you'll get sick. You'll get sick. If eating too much honey is bad... What happens when you use these laboratory sugars? What do you think that's going to do to you? Or cane sugar that's never in the Bible. And any time we see it in history, we see people lethargic with signs of diabetes. All right. Here's another headline from the other day. Sugar is addictive, like opiates. Eating a lot of sugar over a long period of time changes our brain chemistry, they found out now. We need more sugar to feel good. That's why you got to have more and more of the junk food. That's why they stick it in the food. It's a drug. When you first cut out sugar, you may experience withdrawal symptoms. Uh, Mowbray even had friends get angry with her at parties when she was skipping the cocktails and cookies. She spoke with psychologist Amanda Hills about the issue, who said often people do it because there's something they want to change about themselves but can't bring themselves to it. Seeing you just say no to sweets feels threatening to them because it highlights a behavior they feel a little guilty about themselves. Hey, if a psychologist can have that much light, I believe we ought to have that light as Christians. A lot of people are angry because they know they're addicted. And when somebody's an addict, they will, here, just eat it. Just eat a little bit. Or just smoke this. You ever been in school? They want you to smoke the cigarette too, don't they? They want you to have the drink too. No, no, I don't drink. Oh, they want you to have that drink, see. They want you to smoke the joints, smoke the cigarette. And it's very similar. Well, will you please eat the cupcake? Come on, come on, eat the cupcake. No, I don't eat the cupcake. They don't like seeing you with self-control. You see that? I tell you, misery loves company, doesn't it? If somebody goes and loses their purity in, in, in public school, what do they? They want all the girls to do it, right? Amen? See, misery loves company, folks. Learn that. Here's another one. Fox News. No, here's another one. Harvard Education. Uh, sugar. Stan's accused. Sugar was in the dark at, doc at Harvard Law School this week, accused of prime role in the twin epidemics of obesity and diabetes sweeping the country. Fox News, January 11th, five ways sugar can kill you. News Yahoo, just the other day, sugar is the alcohol of the child, says children's health expert. Lustig has called sugar toxic and has written anti-sugar books. The doctor said sugar acts much like alcohol in the body. They both end up being turned into liver fat. And we now know that liver fat is the driver of all chronic metabolic diseases that have befallen Western society. I tell you what, old Matthew Henry, he said, you don't want to eat much sugar. It's the key to all, all these diseases that come from it. I mean, hey, he was centuries ahead of his time, wasn't he? 
And that was good honey he was talking about. He said good honey leads to all these diseases. I think the man knew more than many know today who think they know something. If good honey can lead to all these diseases, what in the world happens with refined flour, sucrose? What in the world is that? High fructose corn syrup, cane juice, which isn't nothing but just sugar with another name. I mean, what, what, what do you think is going to happen to you when you put this stuff in your body, friend? No wonder your immunity goes down, you get filled with inflammation, your teeth rots out, and you start getting sick. Uh, here's KansasCity.com. Eat your Danish before you read the case against sugar, January 21st. It turns out if your blood sugar level is high, your body will burn glucose for energy rather than fat. Ah, that's what we're talking about. But obesity is the least of sugar users' woes. The sugar industry has been extremely active over the past 150 plus years making sure business comes before good health. When people begin to eat the way Westerners do, it takes not more than a decade or so before the same cluster of diseases pops up. We're in the midst of an epidemic. Self Magazine, January 18th, all the ways nutrition labels disguise added sugar. Well, good, January 18th, if there was one thing scientists, nutritionists, and consumers unanimously agreed on in 2016, it was this. Sugar is very, very bad. Praise the Lord. God let us be 20 years ahead of the time. More than gluten, and certainly more than fat, which is actually good for you, by the way. Sugar has been deemed so harmful that even the FDA is now cracking down. In September 2016, the New York Times published a jaw-dropping article revealing that in the 1960s, the industry paid Harvard researchers to say that, really, sugar isn't that bad for you. It's fat that's the problem. Oh, they're awake now. They're awake now. Hey, but we ought to not deny the power thereof. We ought to give God glory. We ought to get to this Bible and start giving God glory because he's right all the time, and we need to give God glory. Uh, I tell you what, people are finding knowledge. Knowledge is increasing, but they're not giving God glory. Amen? We need to give God glory. He gives us the revelation. He says, I give you good things to eat. I give you good wisdom to heal you, and your youth may be renewed. He says that he gives you food and tells you a way to eat that will renew your youth. It's not absolute. It's not absolute. It's not going to totally 100% reverse old age. But he says, compared to everybody else, it's going to be amazing. You eat the way I tell you to eat. It's one of my benefits. He says, hey, you believe in forgiveness of sins. Don't despise this benefit. I give you good things to eat, says God, that your youth may be renewed. Why do we forget that benefit? Man, that's something I would like to have. And if you say, well, I don't care about dying. Hey, God, all throughout the Bible, says if you do this, young man, you'll live a long life. If you say, well, I don't want to live a long life. Well, yeah, you ought to for God. You've been put down here to live for God and bring forth fruit. You ought to want to be down here. I know that there's part of us that wants to go be with the Lord, but Paul said there's another part that says, I want to be down here and get to work and take care of things for God. You ought to want to live to bring glory to God. Amen. Teach your grandkids. Teach their kids. You ought to want a long life to be able to help God. Not that you, God needs you, but he does want servants and people that will stand in the gap for him. American Physiological Society, January 19th, a few days ago. It's the type, not just the amount of sugar consumption that matters and risk of health problems. Woo, they finally got there. I told you that seven years ago that they finally learned that it's not fat, but the type of fat. I said they'll do the same exact thing with sugar. They're going to find out that it's not just sugar's bad. It's the type of sugar that's bad. And they're at the doorstep of it now. The problem is in their laboratories are taking fructose, which they've created pretty much. Then they're taking sucrose, and they're feeding them to rats, and they're seeing what happens, see. And they're realizing that different things happen based upon the different type of sugar. And, I'm, and, and they say, look, fructose is bad. Fructose is bad. I, and I would say, hey, give the rats raisins and apples and do your same study and tell me that, that you're going to get the same result. You created something that's not in nature. When you take the willow tree and you grab the leaf, and you eat that leaf of the white willow, and it, it's a pain reliever in your life, anti-inflammatory, 
and it doesn't rot your brain and rot your stomach. But if you say, let me take that leaf and isolate the acid and then give that to you, and we'll call it aspirin, now you take that and you, you bring a hole in your brain, you, you rot a hole in your intestines, in your gut, and you begin to kill yourself and have internal bleeding, uh, that's because you isolated something in a way God never ordained. You understand that? That's what's happening with the sugar. God gives you an apple, but we want to isolate whatever's in there. <clears throat> God never said to do that. God never says to do that. The Bible says apple's a medicine. So don't you let them lie to you. <clears throat> they say, well, fructose is bad. Well, good. Stay away from their stinking fructose. Amen? Amen. I don't, I don't sprinkle fructose all over my stuff. I eat raisins, I eat grapes, I eat apples. They say, well, fructose is in that honey. Well, praise God. There's a lot of things in that honey. And God made it so I can eat it. Amen? So you keep your stinking hands off stuff, and it'll be good, and it'll be right. See, that's what they're going to find out. That's what they're going to find out. They're already finding it out. I'm just saying, along with what God's telling us right here, eat it in moderation. Make sure your body can handle it. Make sure you're getting enough exercise. Make sure you're balanced. There's one thing they agreed upon, is that sugar is very, very bad. Well, amen to that. We've been saying it for I don't know how many years. I'm glad that all of them agree pretty much now. Uh, here's itechpost.com, January 21st. What type of sugar you take is more important, not how much. Well, the truth of the matter is, my friends, is both is important. The type of sugar and how much, they're both important. Let me close with some very important verses. Daniel 4, the king spake and says, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment. And those that walk in pride, he is able to obey. What happened to Nebuchadnezzar? What happened between verse 30 and verse 37? What is the difference between the king in verse 30 and in verse 37? In verse 30, he's taking glory for all that he has done and not giving that glory to God. And God humbled him and he began to eat grass. He lived off of it. But he went mad. And after that time, Nebuchadnezzar opened his mouth and praised the king of heaven and glorified God. And he learned something here, that God is able to humble you when you walk in pride. And so you better lower yourself and humble yourself in the eyes of God before he humbles you. Amen? God help us. But you know what? The king of Babylon was able to come out of it. But his nephew or whoever Belshazzar was, it says in Deuteronomy 8, Thou shalt say in thy heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. And that's exactly what Belshazzar said. And he died. Belshazzar died instantly. He walked in pride and God killed him. All throughout the Bible, pride is bad. Self-glory is bad. Whatever you think you have, you better be sober in regard to whether you really have the ability and then you better let others praise you and not your own lips. And then we better give whatever we have Whatever knowledge, whatever wisdom, whatever talent, whatever ability, whatever goodness, we better give God the glory and say thank you for it, God. To God be the glory. But people are walking in pride today. Pride is an epidemic. The Bible said Laodicea, the last church, will in their own eyes be rich and in need of nothing. The Bible says a generation will arise that is clean in their own eyes, but is not washed from their filthiness. We're in that generation right now, folks. We're in that generation. And how bizarre that right here in the midst of that generation, you've got toxic sugars, frankenfoods, laboratory creations, drugs that you should never stick in your mouth have been put on everybody's table. You go to Walmart, it's in everything. It's in everything. You say, it's impossible. Don't tell me it's impossible. For 25 years or more, I've been 100% sugar-free. Don't you tell me it's impossible. I read ingredients. I read ingredients. And I'm blessed with the fruit of it. There's things I'm just now learning. I'm learning more about it all. 
But it'll bless you. It'll bless your family. It'll bless your children's teeth. But far more than just their teeth, my friend. I watched one little boy get lollipops and suckers and cane sugar. Every time I saw him, he was sucking on something. I told his mama, I said, man, he's going to get diabetes. It wasn't but a couple years later, that, that little boy had to shoot insulin in his arm all throughout the day. I said, sister, I don't understand why you did that. You know, I, I don't understand it. She said, well, grandparent, everybody else gives it to him. Well, I saw you give it to him. See, I just don't understand it. Well, maybe it's hard to believe a preacher way back then, you know. But this is front page of every paper just about. Or if not front page, it's in just about every paper in America today. Go home and Google it. So it's time to wake up. As Christians, it's time. Uh, there was a time when you could have been the head and you could have led others and saved their life. And they'll say, wow, we got such good health. What else do you know? Well, let me tell you something more important than just your body. Let me tell you about the blood of Jesus that covers your sin. Let me tell you something. In other words, you could have given them a blessing spiritually and physically. But now, at least don't walk in a way where even the world can look at you and be ashamed of what you're doing. Say, well, everybody knows you ought not do that. You're supposed to be a Christian. Dear Holy God, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for the wisdom in the Bible. I thank you, Lord, for the things we know. And Father, I'm aware that we should know a lot more, all of us, God. Father, I do pray you forgive those that have been stubborn, lazy. And I know sometimes, Lord, it's, it's not a problem in regard to knowledge. It's an addiction, Father. It's an addiction. And Father, we need you. We need your Holy Ghost to break these addictions. Father, whatever the addiction is, whether it be pornography, whether it be uh, filthy language, whether it be nicotine, or, 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 or whether it be this wicked, uh, toxic sugar that, that, that kills so many, Lord, and ruins our health and immune system, Father, I do pray that you help Christians overcome, Lord, to be wise, to learn, and let us love one another and be patient with one another, Lord, but... I do pray that you'll move people, God. No, the curse doesn't come without a cause, God. I love these people, Father. and Those that listen, I want them to be healthy, God. I want them to experience fullness of health. But I want their soul to prosper. But you've tell, you told us in the Word, dear Lord, that our hearts can be overcharged from overcharging our bodies, God. Oh, Father. This means there's a lot of spiritual problems that are coming because they don't have this physical thing straight, God. Please help us. May this year be a year of change for many Christians and for their children. May they begin to walk in new life and abundant health, God. May they begin to grow and learn <clears throat> and get victory. And Father, ultimately, may we get victory over the pride that is innate within all of us, God. May we fear you and humble ourselves before you and give you the glory for all things that we are or think we are. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen.